My name is Patrick Lippert, most people here, but not everybody. I'm the CEO of the Migrant Association of Ireland. We're delighted to have with us today um, two experts who've just actually come from a big migrant international conference in London. Um, the first speaker um, who's going to speak is Alan Hervey. Now, most people will have seen uh, both Lars and Alan's backgrounds, but I'll just briefly mention. Okay. Um, Alan is a neurologist and professor at the School of Medicine in Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia in Canada, past president of the American Headache Society, and also served as president of the Canadian Headache Society, and he's on the board of directors of the International Headache Society. We're having their biannual congress in Dublin next September, which we're delighted about again. We have all the best people in the world here. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm just going to give Lars talk and he can give mine. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come to Ireland, a beautiful country. I uh, have Scottish and English uh, ancestors, unfortunately, but my wife has uh, Irish ancestry. Uh, I'm just going to present some things today. None of this represents the opinion of the American Headache Society. But just because I say it doesn't mean they agree with it. You may want to know why a Canadian is the head of the American Medic Society and President, but I won't explain that right now. We can take that up in question period. But I've just finished my term and they tell me the best job is past president. <laughs> so I'm good. So what I did is I put together this talk, and I've given this uh, a bit before, but I wanted to focus in on the diagnosis and treatment of migraine. And although it seems to be rather straightforward is anything but straightforward. Everybody in this room has migraine, anybody has to deal with migraine patients recognize this is very complex. So I thought I would just uh, do that. Now Patrick gave me some goals. <laughs> in fact, he gave me a lot of goals. And uh, so I said, I'll present a general session on migraine identifying different types, outlining most effective current therapy available for these types of migraine, and he just wants me to cover migraine with aura, migraine with out aura, acute chronic migraine, hemiplegic late life migraine accompaniments. And while I'm at it, maybe I could talk about primary, secondary headaches, symptoms of migraine, types of migraine, other headache disorders, cluster, main symptoms, triggers, hormonal factors, most important clinical points, taking a history, treatment, acute prevent, and what treatments work the best. In half an hour. So I think uh, you'll now know why What's in black is what I intend to do. What's in dark blue is what I might help do. And what is on the next page is absolutely possible for me to do all this in a half an hour. But, you know, if you want to stay for two and a half days, we could start. Okay? So here we go. And here's a famous Canadian. Uh, the Americans like to own him, but they like to own everybody once you move to that country. And Sir William Osler said, it's much more important to know what sort of a patient has the disease and what sort of a disease the patient has. And I will guarantee you in, in neurology that's very important, remains important no matter how good the MR scans, PET scans, and other <coughs> diagnostic criteria get. It's absolutely important to know who you're dealing with. Um, we're going to talk to the pharmacist later tonight, and if I went to a pharmacist uh, when I was a kid, they used to give out things called 222s. I think they were made by Merck or company, something like that. They contain aspirin and codeine. If they gave me a 222, my mother was a nurse during the war, it would work. But if they gave me aspirin and codeine, it didn't work. So it really is important to understand that if the pharmacist knows the patient, the patient could be better off. And it goes for doctors, students, and researchers. And I think you'll come back to that thought. And even though there have been tremendous advances in the science of migraine, uh, and, and understanding the pathophysiology and understanding it's a true neurological disorder uh, and the new and exciting advances which I'll leave for Dr. Edmondson if I'm not that exciting and uh, if, if you really see what's going on in the world of migraine then obviously you're going to realize that uh, this still becomes the cardinal interaction with the patient and if it's missing things just don't work. Okay. So now they have an International Classification of Headache Disorders, third edition, the ICHD-3. It was a beta edition for a bit, and basically that gave an opportunity for people to write in and change the criteria, give suggestions, or do on 
field work and seeing whether they could prove one disorder or another. This is the pocket version, which you can get because there are 300 types of headache here. And there are 13 pages of migraine alone. So I think one has to be a bit parsimonious, as the Scottish used to say, and cut it down to things that work. I used to tell the students it was tick stacks and toes. Ticks for trigeminal neuralgia and further, tick delarue, stacks for trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia and toes for trigeminally originating events. I made that up. But truth be told, they're all the trigeminal nerves. So in fact, the, the trigeminal nerve is basically the nerve of headache. But you can get this, and here's the differential diagnosis for, for migraine on its own. Majority will be migraine without aura. 20% be migraine with aura. But the aura can be typical or atypical. If it's typical aura, uh, then it can be under typical aura with headache and typical aura without headache. You can have brainstem aura. You used to call it Bickerstaff's migraine. It was a bilateral phenomenon that looked like you had dizziness, syncope, bilateral numbness, visual loss, etc., etc. By and large, uh, it's better not to diagnose that ever. Because originally, when these new drugs came out in the 1990s, the trip dance, they had contraindications. One of them was vertebral basilar migraine, the other was hemiplegic migraine, correct? Now, if you diagnose them, you can't give the drugs, correct? Wrong. You could give them. And there have been some off-label uses and some reports in the literature of case-based people using them. But here's the secret. If you don't make the diagnosis, then you can go ahead and use them. Because most migraine is posterior circulation anyway. And in fact, Bickerstaff's migraine turned into what they call uh, spreading depression in the posterior fossa structures, the cerebellar hemispheres and neuromboencephalon and all that. So really, you know, you have to look careful at that. Uh, migraine, hemiplegic migraine, which is a fascinating series of uh, familial type migraine disorders. A lot of people, have you seen that? Everybody seen that? How many cases? <laughs> Not very many. And uh, the problem with that diagnosis is simple. Patients with migraine can come in with a sensory loss over one half of their body. They can be face and hand, particularly and then they go on the arm and leg, and they can develop numbness of the tongue, which differentiates it from a transient ischemic attack due to a stroke. That's an interesting little clue. <coughs> but people will come in and say, my side is weak, but they don't mean weak, they mean it's numb. And that is not hemiplegic migraine in any, any sense of the word, because the hemiplegic migraine truly develop a paralysis, which can last days to even weeks. So, Patients say this, and when they say they're weak on one side, you want to ask them, what do you mean by that? Do you mean you're paralyzed? Because that would be in this group. Is there a family history of this? Or just feel this sort of numbness or heaviness on one side of the body? Retinal migraine, or sporadic hemiplegic migraine, means there's no family history. It makes it exceedingly difficult to differentiate that from other neurological disorders, and that would have to be investigated very thoroughly because it could be something else. Retinal migraine, very rare. Who's seen that? Again, uh, one would argue, is it retinal? And my neuro-ophthalmology friends, which I keep in my back pocket, you should always have a good neuro-ophthalmologist to talk to if you're doing migraines, okay? Uh, they want to look for trouble in the retina and the central retinal artery, and it can mimic many other monoocular signs of neurologic disease, so I would suggest that if you have somebody with a retinal migraine, you probably want to investigate that. And if everything else turns out to be negative, and they have migraine, then possibly that's the diagnosis. Next one, uh, chronic migraine. Um, this is somewhat of a made-up disorder. Uh, I'll go into that a bit later. It didn't exist until there was a need to use one specific therapy for it. Botulinum. Uh, and in fact, I think it's a made-up disease. The question is, is, is the brain normal between migraine attacks and Dr. Uh, Edmondson? There's some ed imaging evidence that it can return. Other Im imaging say high sensitivity in the cephalocortex cortex or other parts of the brain for vision. But as Richard Lipton said at one of our meetings in, in, in the United States about a year ago, he said, migraine is a chronic problem with episodic exacerbations. Now think about that, that's a huge difference in thinking. Because if you think about epilepsy, don't think about it too much, because it is very interesting, 
Uh, if you think in epilepsy, it's a chronic condition. It's always there with a tendency to have seizures once in a while. So migraine sort of is always there with a tendency to have headaches. The difference between chronic migraine and acute migraine become a little bit of a moot point and questionable. In other words, everybody probably has this tendency, right? Uh, or what, uh, what Oliver Sacks called diathesis, a tendency towards having migraine all the time. Now some believe you have it, goes away, you normalize the brain and then get it again. It's a clinically very useful question to think about. Status migranosis, any prolonged headache over 72 hours, very severe, usually presents significant problems in the emergency department, nausea, vomiting, dehydration, has to be taken seriously, it runs huge risks of secondary problems. Persists in aura without infarction, migranous infarction, that's not that common, but if you see somebody that has a classic migraine attack, like I saw a nurse, she was 32 years old, she comes in with typical scintillating scotoma, zigzag lines, she has numbness over her face and tongue and arm, and she progresses on to hemiplegia, which persisted, and on her MR scan she has an infarct in her thalamus on the opposite side of the brain. So that's truly probably a true migranous infarction. But what's more likely to occur is someone could have migraine here and a stroke here. And because they occur, that doesn't mean causality is there. It doesn't mean A equals B or A leads to B. But it's important mainly because people who have migraine with aura have an increased risk, not significant, but uh, enough that they have to be aware of it. And also, if young women take oral contraceptive medication, have migraine with aura, are over age 35, and smoke cigarettes, well, that's not a good thing. They can add up to all sorts of problems for that particular patient. Okay, uh, persistent migraine aura triggered seizure. Uh, gets into the land of migralepsy, the diagnosis of migraine and seizures in the same patient as described by Sir William Gowers. Uh, and then we get episodic syndromes, which in the past used to be separate. Cyclical vomiting syndrome occurring in children and infrequently in adults, and this one mainly in children. Uh, look, they're migrants in the tendency that they have these paroxysmal events, they have other migrants like features, but there are other causes for that. So the second biggest brain in the human body is the gut. So you can understand if you have a disorder that affects the brain, it could affect that. Benign paroxysmal vertigo, it's not so benign because people spin in circles, comes around and then the torticollis is over. So it's easy, we'll just talk about each one for the next two and a half hours. But here is the uh, typical differential here between migraine and tension type headache. Tension type headache is supposedly the commonest headache in the world. But if they're coming to seek physicians, the likelihood is they do not have tension headache. People with tension headache lack all the characteristics of migraine. For instance, uh, people with tension headache, uh, they overlap in time. Four to 72 hours for migraine, 30 minutes to seven days. Unilateral, 40%, bilateral, pulsing, pressing. Non-pulsing might be important, a feeling of a pressure. But even the severity, mild to moderate, moderate to severe, aggravated or caused by avoidance of activity, I call this the, the couch potato phenomenon. If you're, laying, if you're sitting at home and you don't want to get up and walk upstairs or you don't want to go do an activity, in the past you had to do the activity to call it migraine. Now you don't have to. You just have to sit there and say, I'm not going to do this. It'll give me a headache. <coughs> so I call it the couch potato. You guys got to get a better sense of humor early in the day. Now, nausea or vomiting, photophobia, one or both, and osmophobia, actually, aversion to smell is very sensitive over these two. So. Migraine is only migraine because it's what we call in Canada the notwithstanding clause in our constitution. Notwithstanding the above, Quebec can, can do whatever the hell they want. Uh, and I won't go into that any further. So all of these things, everything, migraine can mimic everything. Now, this is Dr. Charles, Andy Charles from UCLA. This is kind of his map of the migraine attack. And you've seen this before. You've seen the attack with the prodrome, the headache phase, and postdrome, and possibly the aura that sits in there. Well, he's made this a little bit more interesting and exciting by adding in premonitory symptoms, the aura, visual symptoms by and large, the headache phase, which most people 
think that's why patients come to see us. They do come to see us, but a lot of people come and see us because of the neurological aura and then the post drone. And what's happened is it's very interesting premonitory signs before the attack starts. The one I like the most is Johnny. And when I'm talking to the medical students and residents, I just love to see somebody in the audience yawn. Because either they're bored, they don't like my talk, or I say, aha, you're going to get a migraine later today. So you should have listened more carefully. Polyuria, neck pain. That's understandable by simply the anatomy of the nervous system. Fatigue, affective or mood changes, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, smell sensitivity. But that's not net. So the criteria are all very sensitive, but not specific. Uh, the aura uh, overlaps with the nausea. Visual ones are the most common. Uh, sensory is the homuncular marks. There's a little man on the opposite side of the brain. His name is Hell, head, arm, and leg. And as the spreading depression that comes from the back of the brain goes over that part of the cortex, it picks up the head, the arm, and the leg. The only other thing that does that in neurology is a seizure. But in my brain, that might take 10 to 20 minutes. But in a seizure, it might take one to two minutes. And you have to get that history right, because if you get the history right, you can actually make the diagnosis of migraine with aura. If there's anything atypical in it, anything whatsoever atypical in it that requires looking for another cause. So he's also outlined sensory language symptoms. There's a famous uh, uh, video on TV in the United States of a, pro, uh, uh, a, a sportscaster talking about migraine, and suddenly she can't speak. She has an aphasic uh, loss of speech during the, her, uh, her broadcast. Cognitive symptoms, people can feel quite disoriented. Things can occur. The head pain, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the aura and some of this other stuff, then all migraine, most headache disorder would just be pain. Cutaneous allodynia, the interpretation of a non-painful stimulus, right? In other words, touch is usually not painful, but during a migraine, touch becomes quite painful. Uh, many things do, a little breeze on the face or any number, brushing your teeth, which then starts to overlap with other neuralgias. We don't know much about the post but the post drone was very interesting. It would be interesting whether people here feel, uh, what do you do during the post I had one patient, she was an EEG technologist, and she said, during the post I take my trip down, it helps a lot. But we're not sure. But down here, very interestingly, over the last 15 to 20 years, all of these symptoms of migraine have been uh, targeted to areas in the brain. So this is truly a neurological disorder. This is not a headache and headache alone. And mainly the premonitory phases look like they come from the hypothalamus, which controls regulation of heat and temperature, cyclicity, you know, hormonal imbalances and all the things that are really out of our control. And the cortex comes into play when it starts to deal with the aura. And the presumed idea is the visual cortex back here the motor and sensory strip there as this wave of suppression travels over the cortex and gets here. The patient develops visual symptoms, sensory symptoms. They can go on to motor paralysis, aphasia or whatever. And then the head pain is triggered by some mechanism which isn't totally clear no matter how many lectures of pathophysiology you listen to. There's always something missing. Uh, but the, the German uh, discovery of a, a generator system in the pontine area, which is very close to the area that controls the opioid and pain receptors in the brainstem is attractive but not necessarily true. And then we move up through the brain into the thalamus and onto the cortex. So the pain comes in, travels through the fifth nerve, goes into your brainstem down here, up to a deep relay station or train station called the thalamus and onto the cortex. So migraine hijacks the normal anatomy of the brain that produces complex symptomology. It's kind of cool. I mean, the patients, I don't want you to interpret that <laughs> patients find this cool, but they do find it cool if they understand it. If you understand it, it makes sense, and I think that's the big thing. When we look at migraine, we like to look at uh, diagnosing it. We look for the typical headache, and we look for red flags. And they're supposed to be about seven or eight, or over 50. Uh, the new headache begins, right? Systemic illness, yada, yada, yada. But there's probably about 38 or 39 red flags for imaging the brain in a migraine attack. And if you have any of those things, you look for a secondary headache like a tumor, and you do your investigations. What most doctors and most people seeing headaches don't understand is there's another pathway. You make the diagnosis of a primary headache and there are no red flags. Now, there's some atypical feature. Something doesn't fit. So here it is, I have a lady, 
she gave all the criteria for migraine, and she said, but I get this metallic taste in my mouth. That is not a symptom of migraine in terms of it being an ICHD criteria. However, every neurologist knows the patients with migraine, and most migraine patients, some of them do get metallic taste. So it's not out of the picture, it's just atypical. So you may have to look at that because that might suggest something wrong with a temporal lobe, a seizure-like phenomena. So all of those have to be investigated, and this is where the problem comes in, not the usual things. And why is this all so important? Well, there's an oversimplistic diagram of the brain, which we created for our uh, comprehensive migraine education program, the American Headache Society, in 2017, which helped train 7,000 U.S. neurologists in headache. And this program has been accepted by the American Academy of Neurology for their annual meetings on, on headache, right? But I love this diagram. I think this is the best teaching picture there is in the headache field. And the beauty of it is, as Andy, Charles, and I think to some extent Peter Goesby, and I put together this picture of the brain, memoir, in a sagittal section, cut this way, and they superimposed upon this sort of comic book kind of nervous system, right? And here it is. Here's the eye, and the eye going into the uh, center of the brain stem here, the trigeminal area, the fifth nerve and also the maxillary division down here, and uh, the uh, other branches of the uh, trigeminal nerve, right, coming in and, and, and synapsing or connecting at this little golden ball. The blood vessels also are connected in a dual direction here, sending information down into the system and anadromically or against the normal direction of the train tracks, sending information up to the blood vessels to cause dilatation. Importantly, however, this little diagram here shows you the innervation of the neck and the skeletal muscles coming up and, uh, and uh, joining in here as well. That is why in migraine and related disorders, they can overflow the symptomology into the neck and why neck pathology has to be looked for in some cases. This is C1, C2. Now here's something called the cerebellum. And above the cerebellum is an invagination of what they call duramater. The duramater in Latin is called the heart mother, mother, right? So the duramater invaginates here and separates the hemispheres from the brain stem. And as a result, the underside of this is supplied by C1, and the upper side is supplied by a recurrent branch of V1, the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. You don't have to understand all that except to know that therefore a person can have an origin of a headache in the front of their head, but feel it here or they could have the problem in the back of their head or in the back of their brain and feel it up here. This is important to understand. But what I'm trying to show here, and I think what's most exciting, is migraine hijacks all these areas of the brain to produce the symptomology. The brain tumor can hijack this pathway. The vascular mechanism, the stroke can hijack it. Any number of bad diseases. The brain has only so many ways to experience symptoms, and migraine, of course, uses all of them. So, in my opinion, when I talk to the students, I say, everything is migraine unless it isn't. <laughs> everything is migraine unless it isn't. Think about that for a while. In all the cases that didn't turn out to have migraine or tumors or frequently brain tumors present with tension headache and migraine headache rather than other forms of headache. Okay, so here's what we do. We manage headache disorders by excluding secondary ones. Very important, in fact, of the four hours your students get on headache in medical school, ours get about two. You're doing twice as good as us. Uh, the whole emphasis is on excluding secondary headaches, things that are treatable and can be uh, life-threatening and serious. Identify primary headaches, they maybe learn about migraine, they learn a little bit about cluster, but not much, because most of them are not going to see it. And even if a doctor sees cluster and only sees an occasional one, they probably should investigate it, because they don't see that many. Uh, but what here is diagnosis syndromic group, migraine and things that go along with it, recognizing significant comorbidities that occur particularly as chronification occurs, exacerbating factors, triggers, disability characteristics, review prior treatments. So when you enter the medical system, there's a huge emphasis on doing this. You've got a normal CT or an MR diagnosis and adios goodbye. Or You've got a primary headache, here's your trip to diagnose dose and adios, goodbye. But the idea of actually going on to meet all those other parameters and managing one patient can be extremely difficult, it takes a lot of time, and a lot of knowledge, and it's hard to do. 
formulate a treatment plan. So I think we skipped that. So in traditional migraine management, as we all know, acute therapy, preventative therapy, behavioral therapies, but then you also have to manage the comorbid disorders that go along with migraine because these will determine disease progression. And migraine is a disease. It's not simply a, 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 a disorder, as some would like to. It can be actually a disease. But what do patients want? In this uh, study by Richard Lipton at Allen, New York, most people want complete relief. 87% of people in this survey, rough 688 people, done in 1999, about eight or nine years into the Tryptan era. Most people don't want recurrence. Most people want rapid onset of treatment. They don't want any side effects from the medication, therefore you can't give them anything. <laughs> and they want relief of associated symptoms, nausea, vomiting, etc. And they want the route of administration to be easy. When Zonitriptan came out, it came out in a nasal spray, which was kind of cool, except the survey showed that women didn't like nasal spray, and since about 70% of migraineurs were women, they didn't take it. So people want a pill. All right, so here, here are the things what they want, but they don't necessarily get them. Now, the age of the trip dance began in about 1990, is that right? It's around 1990 or so. And this is, a, this is sort of a brain uh, drawn by Dr. Richard Hargraves, who actually discovered uh, risotriptan at the time. And here's the brain, and here's a blood vessel. Uh, seemed to be a big emphasis on this blood vessel, it's bigger than the brain. But anyway, to make a long story short, here are the pathways that go into the brain, as I showed you before, out to the blood vessel, into this magic area in the brain stem where the patient uh, collates all the data, and up to the thalamus under the brain, to the cortex to be appreciated as pain. The tryptans act at two sites. They act on the dend dendrite, which is a, a process at the end of the nerve, at the D receptor, and they also act on the B, the blood vessel receptor. Remember, D for neuron or dendrite, and B for blood vessel. And that's where there was thought to be uh, their activity. In other words, they, they constricted blood vessels. Although there was arguments whether that was the way that benefited the patients and treated them, or they actually have interfered with neuronal activity. And of course, other things were uh, produced during these uh, so-called sterile inflammatory states, which probably don't exist including CGRP, VIP, and other things, right? But back then, that was it. This was the tryptan age. And what an exciting age it was. There were seven of them, right? And how many talks did we go to? Who went to those talks? Thousands and thousands of talks and the tryptans comparing the smallest new ones from one to the other. And look, here's some of tryptan, the classical molecule. And in the Ferrari analysis, published at Lancet, right? Uh, I think I'll go back one because I think I put in, yes, pain-free at two hours. And this didn't mean the pain at then the Galaxo scale was severe headache, some relief, uh, mild, moderate, none. So the people taking the trip dance weren't actually going to zero, they were just getting rid of most of it. And for the bride at the wedding, she wanted to go down to one or zero, but for the bridesmaid, you could go to two or three, okay? So here is kind of interesting, because here's some tryptan under this fantastic meta-analysis done by Ferrari at Allen published. 50 was as good as 100, in fact, a little bit better. But we know that to be partially true. When we started the trials in Canada, we were doing 100 milligrams three times a day. Then it went 100 twice a day. Then the Americans get in at 50 twice a day. And in the drugstores, and I think in Europe, they sell it at 50 milligrams, right? So it all depended on the person's own placebo rate, and the response to it. But here, risotriptan came out a little bit better than sumatriptan. But you gotta look at this. The number of patients in these 24,000 patients studied had headache relief, reduced but not zero at two hours, was for example, uh, ooh, 60% for sumatriptan 100, and 70% for maxol, or what they call risotriptan. You subtract the two, that's 10%, divide it into 100, you get 10. You have to treat 10 more patients with uh, risotriptan to find one better than sumatriptan. That is important to understand because most doctors didn't and he went around telling them it was much better, but it isn't. It's unlikely that it's all that better. This one here, Elmo triptan, I used to call it my friend Elmo because it was a kind and nice, gentle form of triptan, looks quite good because its placebo rate was low. 
So you have to analyze that, but if you look again at the true relief, in other words, pain-free, which is what the patients want, the numbers aren't so impressive. They're not 60 or 70 percent, they're down around 30 percent, right? So when you look at that, the number needed to treat was quite significantly higher than if you were just going on the endpoint. Importantly, tolerability and safety, all oral tryptans were well tolerated, no tryptan was demonstrated safer than the others, at marketed dose, all tryptans were effective and equally tolerated. So get ready, because with the CGRP and monoclonal antibodies, you're going to get thousands of lectures, and the likelihood is you're not going to find a huge difference. So you can skip those and come back in about five years and hear the outcome. Now, selecting one was kind of interesting, because they go around and say, oh, this one will produce a certain tryptan side effect. I get tingling in my hands. Well, I felt something in my brain is crossing the blood-brain barrier, but as Dr. Uh, Edmondson will say, that's unlikely to occur with these drugs. And people will say, I can identify which drug I'm on because I can tell its side effects. Well, they were frequently as wrong as they were right. So individual responses could not be predicted. Finding the best one requires trial and error. If one fails, try another. I mean, this was all available. Uh, back, you know, 20 years ago, and people still are trying to differentiate them out. It's more of a marketing scheme than a, uh, a medical one. So tryptans are more alike than different. They all have identical, in quotes, sort of mechanisms of action, and the patients are more different than the tryptans. Think about that. The patients are more different than the tryptans, and we need to do better, and that's where we're headed. And preventive therapies we'll move on to. They're not good enough. Too many of some side effects, some of them are very serious. And you know what the patients wanted? No side effects. Uh, too many interactions. These drugs interact with a lot of drugs. All you have to do is go to a database called Up to Date or any of the other ones online and put in one of these drugs, uh, preventative drugs, and the drugs the patient are on. And particularly as you get more and more complex problems with multiple comorbidities, taking other drugs for depression and other things then the drug interactions become not insignificant. And patients stop taking uh, preventative medicines for three reasons. Do you know what they are? Of course you do, because I put it up on the slide, right? Number one, they don't work. Why would you take a drug that doesn't work? Number two, they have side effects. Why would you take a drug that has side effects? Number three, the one people don't think about, they work. Because there hasn't been a migrant or born who has to come in and said, I'm not having them anymore. One lady came in and said, I'm cured, Dr. Purdy. I don't have any more migraine headaches. I don't have to come back to see you. In this instance, that would have been a nice thing, particularly of our relationship. But it's a joke. Anyway, you got to <laughs> However, I listened for a while, and I listened, and I said, uh, she said, what will I do? I said, we'll make an appointment for six months. Why is that? Well, they're coming back. <laughs> right? If you had epilepsy and told somebody to stop, they wouldn't stop the drug, would they? because the continuous treatment with the medication prevented it. So if migraine turns out to be a chronic disease with episodic exacerbations, they should actually continue their medication, not stop it. However, that's not the way the world works. Here are the preventive medications. You can take any textbook in the world. You can take the American Headache uh, Society guidelines. You can take AAN, which happened to be ours. You can take... Uh, once here in Europe, done by the Scottish, and you must have your own guidelines, and every other group, the European group, you'll come up with the same characters, right? And, you know, I wouldn't take most of these medications if you pay me. Beta blockers, right, make you feel sometimes a little down. They can have other consequences. Anti-epileptics, which should be called anti-seizures. You have a choice here. You can take valproic acid, put on a lot of weight, and lose your hair. Or you can take topiramate, take off a lot of weight, and not understand what room you're in. So you've got a choice, right? Uh, or you could take gabapentin, which doesn't work for anything. But in between, you have these two. So you look at a patient and say, do you want to be overweight and lose your hair? Or do you want to lose weight and not know who I am? Uh, and you'd be surprised at what, what kind of uh, decisions they come up with. Now. Also, valproic acid is contraindicated, really, in the U.S., and should be generally in females and child rearing age groups because of problems of fetal malformation, uh, too 
defects, etc. Where now topiramate can cause cleft palate and things as well. So guess what? In the one group that could use the best preventatives, they can't use them. Now some people use them and say, well, they're not pregnant, we'll give it to them. But you know what? Uh, ask any woman in this room uh, whether they can predict when they're going to become pregnant. If they can, they stop the drug a few months before. I read your book, and I noticed in Ireland they have them sign things saying you won't be pregnant, or something like that, so it's kind of cool. Calcium channel blockers, flunarazine, you get that here? Yeah. yeah. We have it, the Americans don't, but they, they, they cry for it. They send them north of the border to get it from us. But this can produce a Parkinsonian-like syndrome, produce a lot of depression, but it really can be quite uh, useful as a calcium. Verapamil, great for cluster headache, not good for migraine, a lot of side effects, constipation, effect on cardiac rhythm, etc., etc. If you're on any of these, don't worry, it's just I'm trying to point out that uh, should see your doctor. Antidepressants. Antitryptyline, the oldest of all. It's not specific for serotonin like some of the serotonin uh, uptake inhibitors. Uh, however, uh, it, it doesn't seem to have the same uh, a risk of a tryptan reaction or uh, you know serotonin syndrome, although that's rare at all. Uh, and in Canada, we have this in the drinking water. It's so good. That if everybody took it every day, we'd relieve a numerous disorders in neurology. Amitriptyline is a neurologist's secret. The trouble is it, that's another one, the trouble is it causes weight gain. And that is not something that people appreciate. But it, and people use it too high a dose. And there is a less sedating nortriptyline form of the medication, but it's good for all sorts of pain disorders. The NSAIDs have to look out because, of course, they can produce cardiac risks and gastrointestinal problems. Uh, 5-HT, we, do you have methy served it over here at all anymore? No. That was a wonderful medication. And the idea that it could produce a retroperitoneal and cardiac fibrosis was, uh, was important, but it was very rare. I mean, Neil Raskin himself wrote about this, that, you know, they had several cases that went on for a long time. And, or Pete, one woman came in and she'd been on it for two years and never stopped. And it's probably not as bad as you think, but it, it's too bad it disappeared. Um, and the others, riboflavin, magnesium, feverfew, all the rest, including Botox and Gansartan, they have some benefit as well. So now, here's the Canadian recommendations, because why would I put in anything about Canada? Uh, and it's important that the Canadians not only looked at the uh, quality of evidence for topiramate, trial, propranolol trials, uh, and the rest, but they also looked on the recommendation. For instance, I felt proic acid here. It's good quality evidence-based medicine to use it, but it's, it has a weak recommendation because of its potentially serious side effects. So you have to look, and Botox, for instance, down here, is fairly good information in the clinical trials. We could talk about that if you want, and a strong recommendation for use. Etc. So you, you have to look more at what the drug does and what's its side effects than just what its benefits are in a clinical trial. And everyone forgets this. It takes time. It takes months to see the effect. Everything works for three months. Everything. I mean, triple A for three months, or Pranolol for three months. Avoiding the patient for three months. <laughs> Dender love and care for three months. Back to amitriptyline. That's what we did back in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. But the thing that I think Dr. Edmondson will mention are the new drugs start to act pretty quick. Which is rather important because then you might be able to determine early on uh, whether they're beneficial or not. Okay. The data support their usage. Most uh, preventative drugs have not been put through randomized clinical trials. Well, the trials have been done, they're not long enough, they haven't been done, they're only done six weeks, eight weeks. So now you'll see newer ones are 12 weeks and open label for a year or two. And I said everything works for three months, and I couldn't find anybody to say that, so I put personal communication. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the anti-epileptics were going to be the future since they stopped cortical spreading depression based on the work by Cenk Aida and Moskowitz group at Harvard and they seem to tamper down this biological susceptibility to uh, a cortical migraine events. 
So the problems are, are uncertain natural history and prognosis. The aim of drug therapy is only to reduce frequency up to 50% per month, and even the new ones are only up to 50%. How long do you treat? Treat for six months, a year, two years, huh? Compliance is a real issue, and I'll show you that. In a study done and published in Neurology in 2007 by uh, Begal and Lipton, of all the migraine sufferers, this is not chronic migraine, but just episodic, there are about 40% in this group who were candidates for preventative therapy, but only 13% took it. For chronic migraine, only 33% of patients were treated. So people get these things, but they don't take them, always. And here's another problem which is kind of cool. I actually think this is really cool. Cyclicity, it's nothing to do with a bicycle, but it has that kind of ring to it was common in headache frequency. When they looked at the Cameo study, which is a huge database of migraine patients in the United States, they found that on one day a patient may have monthly headache frequency, oh, they may have one headache a month, up to, oh, let's say 26 days, right? And they found over time that the patients were between themselves and were cycling back and forth. So how do you define acute migraine and chronic migraine, which is more than 15 days a month? which was made up, by the way. They decided 15, that's half. Why not 60? Why not 14? And uh, therefore, virtually every subject exhibits substantial fluctuations. So at one point, you saw the doctor up here, you were having recurrent, uh, severe acute headaches, and if they were cycling enough over time and above the line, then you'd be called chronic daily headache. He had a two diagnosis based on the fact if you're only down here at couple of attacks a month and never up there, then you only had episodic migraine. Very, very important to understand where people lie. Yeah, minority of migraine patients receive minimal appropriate care. A study by David Dodick that mentioned at our meeting in Los Angeles, 24, 1,254 patients meeting the criteria for chronic migraine, which is basically you have to have migraine characteristics like six to eight days a month, which isn't hard to do. You don't care what you have the rest of the time. Plus or minus medication, more than 15 days a month. So I would just say, you have headache yet? How many days a month do you have? 20? It's, you're basically there. It's not a difficult diagnosis. Uh, only 41% saw a healthcare professional. Only 11% diagnosed the chronic migraine. And only 4.5% received therapy. So even when you diagnose it, you don't necessarily get the treatment. Now here's an interesting thing. You go from no migraine, to low frequency episodic, high frequency episodic, and to chronic. And the chronic migraine, of course, is typical migraine attack superimposed in a background, sort of dull, continuous headache, which is the characteristics of, quote, tension type headache, right? And it's kind of cool that the diagram should go this way uh, in progression, but it's also that it goes backwards, but I rarely see it ever go backwards. So this is the time to see somebody. You really want to start with the early migraine nerve, young patients, see if you can get them to, to, to sort out things before they get to this stage. This stage, more preventative. When they get to this stage, it becomes even more difficult. And if you look at the long duration headaches, more than 15 days a month, here's chronic migraine, and this one is basically new daily persistent headache, untreatable hemicrania, continua response to, uh, to uh, endomethacid. So really, you know, it's the one. Okay, now here are the risk factors for chronification. Medication overuse, attack frequency, being overweight, low economic or socioeconomic status, which is not what the doctors see. Certainly not in North America because the patients with that status don't get to see the specialists. The ones that have the money get to see the specialists. And as a result, they miss out on this whole group of people who really are underrepresented in the therapeutic milieu and stressful life events. We had a, a debate on that between a Harvard uh, neurologist and, uh, and I think it was uh, Michelle Ferrari. Do you believe stress causes headaches? Anybody? Yeah, well actually the data from Michelle was much better than it did. But you know, everybody in the room agrees. <laughs> About 80% the stress was the cause, but it doesn't necessarily have to relate. Head injury produces a migraine-like state, obstructive sleep apnea, too much caffeine, depression, presence of continuous allodynia in other parts of the body, and ongoing anxiety. So from episodic frequent 
and chronic patients cross over into multiple comorbid disorders, many of which are very complex. Neurologists are trained to treat headache and that. They're not necessarily pain specialists, rehab specialists, psychiatrists, psychologists. It's extremely difficult because you're moving the patient into an area where they're not trained to do any of these things. So complexity increases treatment and expectations change for everyone. Uh, Dr. Lipton said in London, he said, you know, the parsimony, if you, if you take out all the comorbid disorders and just deal with the headache, then you make an underdiagnosis of the problem because you're being parsimonious. You're, being, you're cutting back on that uh, need to explore other things. But if you add in all the comorbid disorders to migraine, then you make it into a complex situation where it's very hard to treat because you only understand like one or five of the disorders. So this is a very difficult area for neurologists extremely difficult. So our treatments are not better yet. Chronicity is a big problem for treatment. Placebos are a huge dilemma and an opportunity. Probably the biggest placebo in the room is the physician with the white coat. <laughs> Take this medication, it'll make you better. The one I like is the nocebo response. That person gave you that medication, it'll never work. And the patient immediately says, oh gosh, I shouldn't take that. Where in fact, that may be just based on a personal opinion, not evidence or anything else. So neuromodulation, you know, electrifying the brain, which can be good and not good, uh, question is it hype or is it hope? And uh, you look at the ball, you look at the cephaly device, and you know, the original trial on that didn't meet us in point. But now they've got one where they just have the Princess Leia effect here in the middle of the head, but with other things going on. Has anybody tried those at meetings? Do they give you a peculiar tingling in the head? It's very uncomfortable. Uh, anyway, it, they usually cause no harm, but this one, transcranial magnetic stimulation, approved by the FDA, it probably works, but it doesn't give enough stimulation to do a lot to the brain. Certainly is sub-epileptic in nature. Thank God. And also, it uh, you know these are expensive little devices. Sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation for cluster in particular probably is going to be quite helpful. And the early studies suggest that vagal nerve stimulation with this they have a little snowman you put in your neck and you vibrate it. It's pretty questionable evidence, you know, uh, for acute migraine and chronic, right? I used to kid around, and I know they're recording this, and I can, I've said it at meetings. I find my electric razor in the morning does a better job. <laughs> so other therapies rarely stop severe migraine, right? I'm not saying complementary or, or alternative therapies aren't helpful. Again, it depends on the placebo response of the individual, the therapist, the interest in the patient, the interaction, and belief, because belief triumphs uh, science. A patient, I said, if you tell me running around this building backwards three times, stop your migraine, you go right ahead. If they believe it. But stop, look to the right and left to make sure our car is the issue. <laughs> so lo and behold, about a year ago, Tom Ward, the editor of uh, Headache, the Journal in North America, sends me this paper. There's a study from Italy but always a study from Italy. And I uh, looked at it, and it was about the history of exercise and headache. And one of the things that came up, I don't know if it was Greek or Roman, I'll have to look it up, is the patients that moved backwards had less pain. So you know what? There's probably evidence for them running backwards around the building, but it hasn't been published, so I can't say any more. There's no evidence for majority of these things. The cost is high if there's no benefit, it's expensive, and the cost is high if the diagnosis is missed. So, here I am, done. Oh, I like this one, I put it in anyway. Underestimating the value. You know, between medicate and meditate, there's only one different level. <laughs> I thought maybe you should think about that. I didn't have anything else to say. Uh, so here's Osler again. For the young physician, starts life with 20 drugs for each disease. The old physician ends life with one drug for 20 disease. <laughs> there's a bit of what they call wisdom there. Thank you very much.